Greetings. My name is Dmitro Roman Kolchitsky, and welcome to the first episode of AUK Talks. AUK Talks is an initiative created by the American University of Korea to offer our students, our faculty, our community, an opportunity to listen to and learn from career diplomats and Middle East experts about the challenges and opportunities facing diplomats in Kuwait, the region, and the world. Today, we are honored in our inaugural episode to have Her Excellency Nabila Abdullah El Mullah to be our first guest. The ambassador is the first woman from the Gulf Cooperation Council to serve as ambassador in 1993. She is the first woman from the Middle East and Southern Asia to serve as chair of the Board of Governors of the International Atomic Energy Agency in 2002 and 3, and the first Arab woman to serve as permanent resident representative to the United Nations in 2004. And in 2005, she was nominated by civil society for a Nobel Peace Prize. Ambassador Ahlan Wasahlan, welcome to our first episode of AUK Talk. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm proud to be part of AUK community and also looking forward to partake, to impart uh, my experience to the youth of uh, my country and to the students of AUK in particular. Thank you, Ambassador. So let's begin. Can you tell us, to tell our audience something about what was it like being the first Arab woman ambassador to the United Nations? We're starting from the last uh, posting, almost, you know. Uh, it's, uh, you take it for matter of fact. You know, and you don't take it for granted, but still, you know, you're so busy that you don't think of the word first as being part of your CV or something like that. But what matters is what are your qualifications and if you are up to the job. I see. Well, as the first Arab woman blazing the trail for women diplomats from the Gulf, what would you say was the hardest part of pursuing this dipl your diplomatic career? Oh, it all depends on what level, you know, but I found the most difficult part is when you relocate from one posting to, to another, getting used to the uh, surroundings and to the host country. I was told at one time or advised that it, will, it usually takes six months for anyone to adapt. And I find that I thought it can't be if we have a residence and we have office and we have all the stuff. Is that necessary? But it seems that is the case until you come to grips with what is there to learn from. But as a woman, can you, can you tell us some of the challenges that you've had to face that men have not in, the, in your diplomatic track? I think the challenges are the same for the man or the woman. But if, if I'm, think, I'm thinking if I were married and had children, perhaps it would have been more difficult because one has to think also of the schooling, the uh, holidays for the children that might not coincide with your calendar of work uh, and whatnot. The man would usually take care of that, but the woman being multitask person, you know, it takes it to heart and uh, tries her best, you know, to find a solution for everything. So, so then based on your experience, uh, in your opinion, the glass ceiling is a myth? <laughs> well, what, what glass ceiling? This is an expression, I don't know who coined it, but I'm sure it is someone from the West. You know, I, you know, I don't think that there should be a glass ceiling to shatter. On the contrary, my belief and my conviction is that you use an incremental approach. You don't crash, you just push it. Even if it was a glass ceiling, you push it further so you can achieve your objective. I see. Well, with, let's turn then to your educational background. You know, you received your uh, undergraduate and master's degree uh, in international relations from the American University of Beirut. At a time where AUB was, is considered one of the, if not the best, University, and who also graduated a who's who's list of ambassadors and diplomats 
in, in, from, in the Arab world. Could you tell us something about your experience there? And uh, statesman, you know, that graduated from uh, AUB. Uh, it's not only AUB itself, but Lebanon as a whole. At the time that I was studying in, uh, uh, in Beirut, it was a vibrant society. It was a place where uh, politicians will flock so they will be able to air their views, to have uh, the kind of interaction with the population from all over the world. You look around and it's um, rubbing shoulders with all the heads of parties, the, the uh, it was a melting pot for Arab politics, you know, Arab nationalism, you know, the, the uh, uh, anti-colonialism and whatnot. And that is, I really loved the vibrancy of the place. And besides the atmosphere of Lebanon, it was also the vibrancy of the university itself, with uh, the professors uh, being um, uh, solid in their, in their own fields. Uh, who made inroads into the thought, you know, the Arab thought altogether. Constantine uh, Zureyk, uh, Charles Balik, uh, Hanna Batato, Walid Khaldi, Faiz Sayyid, all of these are, you know, you will go to any university, where is this professor teaching? You say, they're all there in AUB. I see. You know? Well, did you, when you went to AUB, it was your intent always to be an undergrad and then eventually a master's in international relations? No, absolutely not. You know, and this is what I'm telling, I tell the, uh, uh, the students here in AUK. You start your studies thinking that you want to major in X, you know. Halfway through you realize, hey, it's not to my liking. And you shift to another topic. And that's what happened to me. I was a science student thinking that I will pursue some kind of uh, studies and I wanted first to I go for petroleum engineering, but I didn't realize that AUB at the time did not admit women into petroleum engineering. So halfway through sophomore year, I found out that uh, there is life in upper campus. That is <laughs> with the, yes, with the yeah. professors who are teaching international relations. And that's why I, I moved, uh, uh, changed courses then, direction, you know. I see. I see. Well, let, then let's turn back to your diplomatic, your career as a diplomat. Uh, your postings have included Belgium, European Union, Austria, South Africa, Zimbabwe, and you've served as a non-resident ambassador to Luxembourg, Cuba, Mexico, Bahamas, the list goes on and on, Hungary, Slovakia, Slovenia, Botswana, Namibia, and the Mauritius. Uh, could you give us kind of a, 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 some, in, some anecdotes about your experience first as a diplomat, uh, then as an ambassador that you could share with us so that our audience can get a sense of behind the scenes kind of life of, of, of a career diplomat and eventually an ambassador. Well, there are so many anecdotes uh, and I know some of them were funny but some of them really hurt because you know you have to adapt to the situation itself. Uh, one of the anecdotes, and that is more recent, it, uh, it was in 2003, and we had uh, a holiday. We uh, were closed in preparation for the National Day in Vienna. And then we were told that a battalion from Slovakia was heading towards Kuwait, and Slovakia used Vienna uh, to take the plane to Kuwait, and they needed visas. So we had to open the embassy <laughs> for no holiday. Why do they choose to fly today? You know, we're having a holiday, you know. So we went back to the embassy so we can grant them uh, the visas. And there is another anecdote that I recollect uh, uh, with, um, uh, with interest because it shows you how much quiet diplomacy can achieve. The inspectors, the International Atomic Agency inspectors, were supposed to go to where the um, uh, nuclear um, waste was, you know, in Tuwaitha, in Iraq. That is during the invasion of uh, Iraq. But they could not because of the military uh, uh, situation and uh, whatnot. So, uh, uh, I was, uh, I used some kind of mediation with our own authorities. We were able 
to uh, give them access to Kuwait and then zoom them out through the border to the Tuaitha so they will do their uh, work on inspecting the, uh, the site. Uh, it's not usually, it doesn't hit newspapers, but that is one thing that you can uh, accomplish with quiet diplomacy. Well, that's very interesting because usually when we, we think of diplomats, we, we, get the fr and we, we get to see what it's like up front and there's all these activities, all these logistics that take place behind the scenes, behind the box, so to speak. So it's, it's very interesting to kind of hear uh, your anecdotes about that. Well, going back to women's participation in, dipl in the diplomatic profession, you know, over the years, uh, with your look reflecting on your career, how has it changed, you know, from the time you started to kind of where, where we are today? Do you have any thoughts on that? I have many thoughts, but some of them I might not be able to share them with well, you. Well, <laughs> share with us the safest ones. Then, there were women um, before me, preceded me in the Foreign Service, uh, and the time when I joined the Foreign Ministry, we were four, and you know, after a couple of years, I was the only survivor <laughs> of the four. And slowly, you know, women started to join the Foreign Service. Uh, it's not an easy thing. It's a man's world, you know, and uh, the norms in the foreign ministry did not allow so much for women's participation, but I think it really matters a lot. The image of a Kuwaiti woman in, uh, the, in foreign countries uh, helps in improving the assessment uh, of the others about the country itself. It softens the uh, image. Uh, and I, I'm saying that aware that also in, in the West, if one wants to be target uh, part of uh, our, uh, the criticism where it comes from, even the West, they're not so much far advanced in terms of the women representation. You know, uh, I recall one time someone was congratulating me for being, oh, the, Ambassador from Kuwait, I said, oh, and congratulations for having the first foreign minister, a woman, you know. So, I mean, sometimes we are very, they are very critical about us, and we play to their, into their hands sure. of criticizing ourselves. And I think we should be judicious and look at every situation in its own framework. Well, then, then what kind of qualities or skills do you think then are important? for the students, for any student considering a diplomatic career? Uh, foremost, I think they, any student should enjoy what he is doing, what she is doing. They should be, they should have it, th their interest, not to read the assigned textbook alone, but to go and read other books that will widen their perspective about things and stuff like that. And I always say they have to have a passion towards, not only the subject, a passion towards learning. Because if you don't have that, you know, slowly what you have is going to be depleted and you will end up with nothing. But to increase and widen their, uh, 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 the area that they looking for, the knowledge that they can help them uh, through. And to persevere, to be resilient, you know, they, and if you don't, uh, if they don't enjoy one aspect, they should refer to another one. You know, you said about the students in, uh, in, uh, in our midst, you know, I don't think that they should have as their target the position of, uh, of being at the helm of being an ambassador. That's not really so enjoyable. I recall one friend telling me, you know, he said, Nabila, you know that it's going to be very lonely when you are at the top. And I realized that was true. I was happier when I was more of a junior diplomat. It's not the title, it's not the post itself. It's what you are doing that is enjoyable in terms of the political solution, looking for the best words to write a, a resolution, and trying to mediate, uh, networking with your colleagues from the Gulf, the Arab world, the Muslim world, and the partners that they, they should have a joy in doing what they are doing. 
You know, this passion, Ambassador, that you're referring to as I'm listening, uh, particularly I'm thinking, you know, from the perspective of students that are, that are you know, they endeavor or they, they dream of, of entering uh, the path of, of diplomacy as a career. Uh, this kind of passion, I mean, you know, where does that come from? You know, when you think about it, is it something that you're born with? Do you think that you're born with, that it's part of your DNA? This intellectual curiosity that you, you kind of uh, emphasize that students, you know, they need to be intellectually curious. They, they need to want to read. Uh, uh, they need to, to listen. They have to love politics, for example. You know, uh, is, is that something you think a person starts off with or is that something that could be honed? can be developed in the environment, nurtured in the environment that they're in? Yeah, I think it's all of the above, you know. It, it might be part of the DNA, but if there is uh, no uh, education, no training, no uh, uh, mentorship, all that DNA will also be depleted, you know. But I think if even a person who does not have these qualities uh, the, he would be, he would develop even further when there is an atmosphere where they could be taught and encouraged to read, yes. to produce, to participate, you know, in debates and things like that, because no one is perfect. I mean, I, I don't know if I have it in my DNA, but I was interested, the whole atmosphere when I told you about AUB, it's the vibrancy around you, you cannot but help being affected by the energy of the professor, by the energy of your other uh, comrades, you know, your colleagues in uh, school, by having a sense of competition, you know, meeting other students, not only in AUB, in AUK, but also abroad, have them meet other uh, students of other nationalities, you know. You know, it's interesting because, you know, uh, in the question, one of the questions that I wanted to ask, uh, also asked today was like what motivated motivated you to pursue a diplomatic career and as as I, I listened to you know your responses to the previous questions you started off as someone potentially pursuing a career in engineering uh, you go to, to AUB and, and suddenly you're surrounded by all this energy this this enthusiasm uh, professors who are, are, are experts in their field and, and students who are pushing each other in other words, there's this competition going on. Uh, but again, the question that I wanted to ask was that, you know, what motivated you to pursue a diplomatic career? Meaning, is it to, to presume that the, the, the motivation was, was engendered at AUB? Uh, did you have something going, something in the back of your mind from the very beginning as you were growing up? Uh, was there some uh, inspiration from the family? Or did it just become something that you decided you wanted to do because of the environment you were, you were in and the kind of people you met uh, at the American University of Beirut? I, I can I say it's all of the above. <laughs> but I think, you know, it's uh, don't forget that uh, we are in a politicized kind of uh, uh, atmosphere, part of the world. All of us, you know, here in Kuwait, you ask anyone in the street, everyone has a view on politics or another. It's not, you know, we're not, we're not detached from uh, uh, the, the, the politics of uh, the country, the politics of the region. Uh, you grow up with the question, with the Palestinian question being there, you know, and uh, you can't help but being uh, absorbing all of that uh, energy. We uh, grew up with the, in the presence of um, uh, Arab uh, uh, tutors that came from Palestine, that came from Egypt, uh, Iraq, Lebanon, Syria. So it was an atmosphere where you, your eyes are open to what is happening in the world. You, you're not you know, I said it's a no, no man is an island. I mean, Kuwait was never an island, always uh, extending itself, its soul uh, outside of its own boundaries. I see. Well, well, then, what kind of encouragement would you give women uh, or men who want to pursue a diplomatic career? And, 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 and what kind of challenges do you think they're going to expect? Let's presume that they have the passion, they have the desire, they have the love of politics. And they're looking for someone to say, okay, 
with those characteristics, those qualities, this is what you're going to have to do if you're going to successfully pursue a career. And these are the kind of challenges you're going to face. Yeah, it's not the, I would say you should not restrict yourself to just a diplomatic career. Let it be called political career, you know, um, a civil society career. Uh, uh, because um, diplomatic career, if you're thinking only in terms of the foreign ministry, you're limiting yourself to a very small sector. Uh, I would say uh, seek uh, uh, experience with the UN agencies, you know. Awesome. And nowadays it is very easy just to look online and see what kind of openings are there for young, uh, 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 young people to be, uh, 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 to be admitted into the UN, even as an intern. You can go there. It's just, I recall now uh, recently they introduced internship for photography. Uh, uh, Shirin Abu Akla uh, at the United Nations. There are so many things one can do to work in an, uh, a bigger than a national, bigger than the, just the foreign ministry. Uh, seek uh, volunteer work um, if you can afford it. You know with the. Uh, with the uh, International Committee of the Red Cross and Red Crescent, uh, you will be involved with all these issues of humanitarian law, you know, and uh, kids of, from our region will be perhaps sought after because of their knowledge of Arabic and whatnot. So the, the, the opportunities are immense. I see, so, so Arabic is important too, right? Because Absolutely. I, I, I know that's a, a, something that I wanted. It was that if you could kind of elaborate that for, for our students, particularly at AUK, that the, the, the importance of Arabic, particularly in the pursuit of a diplomatic career in Kuwait, for example, or yeah. for Kuwait. You know, for, for any, uh, in any kind of application, I will always ask what uh, your uh, knowledge of languages. And usually fl people flock to English, French, Spanish, or whatnot. Arabic is not usually um, in, involved in this kind of uh, 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 guidelines. But you think of it, you know, all these peacekeepers, for example, who are all over the place, they might not be well versed in Arabic. So can you imagine being is, uh, associated with a peacekeeping mission in uh, perhaps uh, in Somalia, although <laughs> it's not the, the best place to go to now for difficulties, knowing Arabic because you will be the representative with the peacekeepers who might not know Arabic at the time, you know, uh, uh, if they are not from Jordan or Egypt, these are the countries that contribute uh, peacekeepers. So you, Arabic is an added value wherever you go in international organizations. It's not only your background in terms of the information. You are an Arab, you get, you get further on, you know. I see. May I ask you two more questions, Ambassador? Absolutely. Two more. Well, first, to the, to the ladies that are listening in, uh, and, and imagining themselves as future career diplomats, uh, whether diplomats in terms of career diplomats or even uh, if one aspires or even achieves the, the, the position of, of an ambassador, uh, what advice would you give them uh, in Kuwait or, or even in the Gulf uh, in terms of the, 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 what they can, um, or any, any kind of advice you could give them in their pursuit of a career in the diplomatic corps? Be true to yourself. See if you really enjoy what you are doing studying even, to start with studies. If you don't enjoy that, you will be miserable the rest of your life, <laughs> even if you are a super ambassador, <laughs> you know. Uh, read and read and read, you know. There is, um, this is my advice to everyone. There is immense wealth in knowledge. The uh, uh, ancient books, you know, classics, classical Arabic books, the uh, current books, and listen to your elders. Uh, and besides reading, enjoying, and reading, I would say, if you're convinced you are there, persevere. 
you'll have to be resilient, you know, and look around for whatever, uh, whenever there is an opportunity opening up for you. Or look around, you know, look around, you know, l further than what your eye needs. It, actually, you've created a transition for my second and last question. And that is, if you were going to recommend for those students who have the intellectual curiosity, they have the passion, desire, uh, are there some books you would recommend? Specifically in dealing with, let's say, Kuwait's history uh, and, and Kuwait's experience, you know, uh, starting with, let's say, the, uh, his attempt to enter the United Nations in, in uh -huh. the early 1960s. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for asking that question because I am one of the believers that uh, if you don't know your own history, you will be lost, you know. And, and a major part of that is our own history as a nation state and how we came about uh, being members in the United Nations and uh, in the Arab League. Uh, and I would recommend to the students to read uh, uh, Ambassador Bishara, Abdullah Bishara's book, uh, Kuwait, uh, Kuwait Diplomatic Wars. Uh, it's in Arabic, and I hope that they will be able to pick it up. I understand that it is being, uh, he's thinking of uh, translating it uh, into English as well. There is another book relating to our own uh, history in our midst, our own region, the Gulf. And that is again by Abdullah Bishara, who traces the establishment of the regional organization, Bain al Muluk wa Salatin. It's a fabulous book. I don't think any other will. Uh, compete with that uh, to give you an insight into what prompted that, how the making, the making of an organization that proved to be the, the, uh, uh, the strongest during our days, you know, when all we had all these turmoils around with the Arab Spring and whatnot, the Gulf Cooperation Council was steadfast in its unified approach towards things being instrumental in finding solutions. And then I would recommend three other books written by our um, uh, um, ambassadors to the UN. You'll have to wait for the fourth, which will be by me, but not yet. <laughs> the uh, first book is by uh, Abdullah Bishara about uh, our experience in the Security Council, our first experience, 1978-79. Uh, uh, the other one is by uh, Ambassador Mohammed Abu Hassan. It's about uh, the uh, our crisis, the, the invasion of uh, Kuwait and the liberation, all the deliberations Security Council. And the third one is a more recent one by Ambassador Mansour Al Atebi uh, about the, the second our experience, the second time we were in the Security Council, 2018-2019. Uh, so these three books, there are only five books, you know, well, <laughs> not much. <laughs> well, thank you, Ambassador. It's, it's been fascinating. Uh, it's uh, uh, been an amazing learning experience, uh, not just, I believe, for our students, um, our faculty, our community, listening to your, uh, to your story as, as an ambassador in your career. Um, and, and we're very grateful. Uh, we're grateful that you were part of our inaugural that you were part of our inaugural episode, our first episode. And I think those that want to pursue have have really had an opportunity to kind of experience some insight uh, than one normally does not get, especially in the classroom, and especially for the women out there who who want to pursue uh, a diplomatic career. Well, this concludes their first ever podcast of AUQ Talks at the American University of Kuwait. I hope everybody enjoyed it, and of course, will join us for our next episode, our next podcast, which will be aired in December, where we'll be exploring Kuwait's culture of diplomacy. So stay tuned.